Welcome back to the Missing Mora Marty podcast. I am Tim here today with Lance and Chloe. What's going on, everybody? Hey, how's it going? We are in our brand new uh, Worcester, Massachusetts studio. Wormtown. Wormtown. Um, still trying to figure out if anyone knows why it's called Wormtown. We have a couple of theories. We'll get to them later. But um, yeah, our first guest here is our old uh, Crawl Space uh, co host or cohort, partner in crime, Chloe Cantor. What's up, Chloe? Not much. I'm excited to be here. It's very good to have a studio space, and it's good to see you too. So thanks for having me on. Nice to see you too. Um, and so today I think we'll be talking a little bit about the disappearance of Maura Murray TV show that just finished airing on Oxygen. And uh, I, I feel like Chloe's take will, will be especially interesting because it's sort of from an outsider's perspective from the show. She's been in the online community and a part of us and this whole Missing Maura Murray community for years, but wasn't really a part of the TV show. Um, so I just kind of curious how it read from an, like someone who was outside the TV show. And also as a, uh, you know, we keep talking about the uh, citizen detectives. You were kind yes. of unintentionally brought into it when you helped us out with Brianna. So here you are witnessing the show, watching the show as part of uh, that community with more Murray and the, um, and with the citizen detective community. So yeah. What's the, uh, what's the overall feeling on it? I, well, my opinion is probably different from, the consensus and I don't even think that it's fair to say that there is a consensus I think that based on what people have been discussing on Facebook on Reddit on a number of different mediums there's a lot of variance in what people thought about the show I think should I start with how how I felt sure or, please sure um I think that this show broke a lot of ground I think that a lot of relationships between investigators and witnesses and family members were damaged and Art and Maggie were able to sort of fix those. We could see the way that they were able to communicate with friends and family. I think that they were able to speak with people that have been silent for many years. And it was just really exciting coming from someone that's been following this case for years. And you can only fill in these spaces in your head, but actually seeing these people talking, like the interview with Kathleen, we haven't seen her sit down and talk to someone for a really long time, probably since the disappearance happened and she was being interviewed by cameras in New Hampshire during the search. So having just having people like Kathleen sit down and talk for the first time was amazing to watch. Yeah. It was a pretty controversial moment there in the show as well. Did you find that it was uh, as controversial as some people made it out to be? I think the when you say it's controversial, I think people felt that she was asked a lot of difficult questions and they had someone in the other room analyzing her body language to see if she was lying when that really wasn't done for anyone else. And I, I get where people are coming from where they say that didn't seem like the most fair thing, but it, it, I don't know if Ma Maggie and Art really had the most say in what people came in or hmm, let me start that over. I don't think that those decisions were made by Maggie and Art about who was coming in and observing the interviews. I yeah. think that Oxygen maybe had more of a say than we like to see. Yeah, well, they, they definitely did. Um, it, it was it was it had nothing to do with Maggie and Art. They did not come up with that idea. They did not decide to get Evie in there to read her uh, body language or anything like that. Um, but it also does speak a little bit to the actual investigation. People have to understand that this is about Mora. And for, for years, Kathleen has not said anything about, I mean, it, there's a direct um, connection there between the phone call that Mora has and, and says my sister. The, and if you're going to interview Kathleen after so many years, as part of an investigative tactic, bringing somebody in to analyze body language, especially if it's a family member, seems like very reasonable to me. And, and I know that, you know, and Kathleen was such a, an amazing person to do the interview. And I, and I know that she probably felt a little slighted by seeing that footage. But that's, that, that's what's got to happen in order for something to shake loose in this case. Because nothing has happened in so long. Right. Right. And, you know, I didn't even think about whether or not that was unfair until I saw the subsequent interviews with law enforcement. Because... I liked that they had someone come in analyzing body language because it kind of kept that in my mind for subsequent interviews, noticing the way that the people were speaking and what they were doing with their body language. And 
but I'm not a body language expert. So it would have been nice if they were able to apply that with everyone. And that's probably what people noticed. Like, why is why do they just have this person coming in for her and not for other people? First of all, they probably didn't have the resources to do that. It wasn't. I don't think that would be allowed. I don't. I don't yeah. think that they could rent the the door next to uh, the the room that they uh, or the, the room next to where they interviewed Cecil Smith and uh, Jeffrey Strelz and, and John Monahan. I doubt they could rent out that room. And, yeah, and they were up with cameras. <laughs> but they did the they did the next best thing, and they had uh, Strelz in there. Yeah, with with them. Well, <laughs> you're joking. No, no, no. If they needed, I well, they not like when I say they, I mean the investigation. Yeah. Him being in the room while they were questioning or while they're interviewing Smith and Jeff Williams, he needed to be in there. His position in, in law enforcement is the senior dictated. assistant attorney general of New Hampshire, by the way, Jeffrey Strelz, that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Um, he, he should be there. It's it, it'd be weird if he wasn't there, you know. So I, all these moves that, you know, kind of raise eyebrows like the body language person and him being in the room. It really, it really is for like the, the investigation. Sure. Yeah. I, if I had that job, I would want to be there. Yeah. So I watch those interviews. I, I think mean, it was to cover his own butt, probably, and, and not yeah. so much his butt, but everybody, like, and, and to cover the creative editing or the potential of creative editing from a show, which happens. So happens. many reasons. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to. Is there information that's going to come out that I haven't heard yet? Why haven't I heard this yet? And then. Yeah, well, I want to make sure that it's not cut in a, you know, they're not taking liberties the way they cut it. Right. Um, and, well, and it's his job. He runs the investigation as far as, like, the, the prosecution, I should say. So he, he really doesn't have anything to do with the day-to-day -day operations of the investigation that goes on now. Mm -hmm. They won't even probably report to him. Like, the cold case shoot it. They don't even talk to him unless they have a big break or something. So are you saying he did it for screen time? <laughs> I'm saying that the communication between the attorney general's <laughs> office and the cold case unit isn't necessarily there. They don't talk on a daily basis yeah. about the Moore and Marty case, I'm sure. Right. And I, I'm, I'm sure maybe you felt the same way, but once they finally started showing the law enforcement interviews, it kind of took my breath away to seeing John Monahan, Cecil Smith, Jeff Williams kind of, I think Jeff Williams wasn't until a subsequent episode, yeah. but these people, we haven't seen them talk we haven't heard them talk since the time since 2004 so i was overwhelmed by it and i thought it was amazing that they were able to get that on camera yeah it really was um a lot of people talk about cecil smith and they still think he's lying about this this zero zero one uh versus zero zero two police vehicle and and so Cecil Smith famously said on the show that he was driving the SUV uh number zero zero one that fateful night and people don't believe him or some people don't it actually like something i've noticed on facebook is it's overwhelming how many people still hold on to the police conspiracy theory and don't believe cecil smith and don't think that maggie and art did enough to probe further into whether or not there could have been there um a lot of things that people are saying is that there hasn't really been a way to confirm whether or not he was driving that car except for his own words which is i've been trying to find corroboration or something that contradicts it and i haven't been able to um have you found anything that the, oh, so you, you haven't found anything that conflicts that well i know for a very long time people were saying presenting it like it was fact that he was driving sedan 002 and but i haven't been able to s find anything on paper that confirms that it was kind of all talk and i don't know exactly where that talk originated but that was I feel, I don't know, maybe you guys disagree, but I feel like that was accepted as fact for a long time to the point that where I, when I saw that interview and he said that he was driving the Ford Explorer, I was shocked. Yeah. I, I did not see that coming. Maybe yeah. you guys did or maybe other people did, but I really did not see that coming. Um, I, I only did because we had heard about it right before. Right. Um, so so we, we knew that was coming. But uh, yeah, I mean... It's quite a stretch to think he's he's covering for Jeff Williams. It right? would be an incredibly bold lie. Yeah, it would be such a bold lie. But doesn't mean it's not a lie. It doesn't mean it's not a lie. I think that, I think that the community would probably feel more confident if there was some way to confirm it. But so far, I haven't been able to find it, and maybe someone else can. I implore everyone to try. <laughs> so we can agree that that Smith, it, it, during the course of his career, was a quality police officer, right? I don't know. I mean, we can, he doesn't have anything on his record. He wasn't fired. He wasn't 
like discharged. He, he, yeah. he, he went out of his way to arrest the, um, just the the chief of police at the time, Jeff Williams. Right. He took over the position. Right. He arrested him for a DUI. So I'll ref- I'll rephrase the question. Yeah, he arrested him on charges of DUI. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing saying that he's a bad person. I think that Cecil arresting the chief probably leads credence to the fact that he didn't have a particular loyalty toward him. The fact that he actually arrested him, or perhaps he stopped his vehicle and then called for reinforcement, and sure. then he was later arrested. I think if there was this loyalty there to the point where he would cover for him on national TV, he probably wouldn't have had him arrested. He would have just right. let him go. So my, my, my point is we're looking for this documentation of who was driving which vehicle. And the police and Smith, they all say that they this vehicle was out of commission and I was driving this vehicle. And we're hearing it from people who have, as far as we know, a, a good record. How is that how, why are we at the point where we, we immediately distrust the chief of police who has a good record and say, well, he must be lying because he's nervous on camera? I think, one, it's because, and I, I'm not trying to criticize anyone, but I think when people are holding on to a theory that makes a lot of sense for a really long time, at least makes sense to them, it's hard for them to let go, especially when they don't have further proof of what he's saying. I don't think he has a reason to lie here, but I think people might be accusing him of lying just because the narrative that's been out there all of this time was that it was a sedan and i don't like i said i don't know where these these i don't, I don't want to say rumors but where the story originated from but you know we've been hearing that 001 was out of commission that it couldn't have possibly been out there that night that it wasn't working that that he was driving the sedan and some people have said that he was definitely driving the sedan 002 because on the dispatch logs, it was identified as H2. Inaccurately identified as H2. Yes. Right. And that was one of the questions that we've always had, which was, what does the H stand for? What does the H plus that number stand for? Because if the police are identified as a certain number in the dispatch log, why would they be identified by a, a letter in a number? And the letter obviously is is Haverhill, right? Yeah. And two and one and three, I'm, I'm, that is the, the rank. He was second in command behind Jeff Williams. So that he's being identified. And we have a, should we say Aaron? Because she has it. Go for it. Okay. And Aaron Larkin was actually face to face with the Haverhill Police Department and just point blank asked them that question. And that's the answer. Yeah. So I'm wondering why we, you know, it's a police department of four back then. Why, why are we, why are they, they can't, they, you know, they're, 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 they're botching the investigation out of you know one breath, people say they're they're botching the investigation, and then the next the next breath is that it's this conspiracy of right. silence. Like, well, if they can't put together, like if they can't hold together an investigation, how are they holding together a conspiracy for thirteen years? So yeah, so what we're talking about if if Cecil Smith really was driving the sedan zero zero two, and Jeff Williams was driving zero zero one that night, we're saying that Cecil Smith was loyal to him then, then not loyal to him several years later when he arrested him for a DUI, and now he's loyal to him again? And covered up and, and con- ma- maintained consistent silence throughout. Yeah, it's it's confusing. Right. Also, I'd like to note that uh, we have heard from Maggie and Art that the cold case unit does have proof that Cecil Smith was driving SU- or, uh, yeah, SUV 001. Um, we are not allowed to say what proof that is, and they have not provided that to us. Uh, so I demand but, it. Well, I demand another, the truth. I demand it. <laughs> but it's another one of those things that people will point to and say, well, they're lying to you guys. You know, they, they don't have proof of this. I mean, how big of a conspiracy is it that now they've dragged Maggie and Art into it, too? I just and potentially us. Right. Yeah. I don't trust you guys anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it is it is wonder. It is a wonderful feeling when you finally let go of of that narrative when when you've held on to a narrative for so long because i mean you and i have tim when we've uh you know talked about the case way back you know and it's like i and it's like i i think i think it was this and and then you you realize after some point like i'm no this, i'm forcing this right now um but once you open it up it's just so it's so like it's like a weight off 
Like, yeah. it, like take this weight of the police conspiracy off and focus, put that energy to something else. I, I just think there are better persons of interest but, right now. Exactly. You know? I, I agree and, too. And, and I think like it's interesting and I, and I want to track this down and I want to see if there's documentation of Cecil Smith driving uh, 002 that night. I think it's something to look into and everything and I encourage people to look into it. Um, but I just think there are better persons of interest. I agree. And I, I would, I would like to see this documentation of it, but if Maggie and Art are saying the cold case unit confirmed it, that kind of closes the door for me for any speculation in that, you know, I, I also feel like, like I said, like, I don't think that it's necessarily just this overwhelming inclination to assume that a police officer is lying and more just that everything we've heard has been different. Like no one until that show has said, oh, it was Cecil Smith was driving 001. Everyone was saying, no, he was definitely driving 002. So, I mean, is it productive to talk about how we got there or? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I suppose it is, but it's probably its own episode. It's Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and it should be noted that Karen McNamara, witness A, who claimed to have seen the SUV at the scene, who drove by after leaving work, um, it's not debunked. She saw what she saw. Right. It just wasn't what it was made into years later. You're talking about the oxygen headline that says "Witness A Debunked." Yeah, which yeah. it isn't. It isn't accurate at all. It sounds like it was. It verified what she saw. Right. She it said, absolutely did. Yeah, yeah. She said that she saw the police SUV, and everyone else was telling her that she didn't. But she was steadfast. No, that's what I saw. And it turns out it is what she saw. Yep. But because people were arguing against it for reasons that I can't quite track back to yet uh it started creating all these ideas that maybe someone's lying that there's some conspiracy out there so that's really what's debunked is she saw what she saw but what's debunked is person x's theory that it was jeff williams driving that vehicle that's pretty much debunked i mean i'm call me naive after all this time naive call me naive, naive but i take the word of art and maggie Cecil Smith, New Hampshire State Police. I'm sorry, I take their word, and I'm that. And call me naive until we have reason not naive. to. Yeah, I, I think that's I just don't it. think we have any reason not to. At first, it seemed like it because there was a contradiction. And there are people who have looked into this case longer than we have. You know, but most notably John Smith, who you know I think is still kind of thinking that this is a possibility um, but he's looked into this a long time so he's looked into this a, lo- a lot longer than we have so sure. maybe we just haven't gotten to that point yet well maybe I mean we should we should maybe talk to him and try to figure out where because I, I believe it was him that was saying that I mean no no I love no. to yeah yeah I mean, it was him he was really putting it out there that he was driving 002 and that Karen was told that that wasn't what she saw and right. that I think I don't know if he said it or if Karen said it, but someone said that she was told that the car was out of commission and that it wasn't possible. So I don't want to just discredit him and say he doesn't know because he's been at it from for 13 years. So yeah. I'd like to know, I guess, where that information is based on. Okay. What? Who told him that it was 002. Right. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll follow that up with John uh, later in, in a subsequent uh, episode. I cooked dinner last night, Lance. It was a black bean quesadilla dish. It was delicious. And you know, I would have been just totally screwed if I didn't have Blue Apron with their recipe cards and their pre-portioned ingredients. Something I thought I'd never hear you say is I cooked black bean quesadillas for dinner, and they were delicious. So they were. I am. I am swelling with pride for you i i just did a seared and i'll i'll show the picture of this soon because it looks delish and it tasted even more delish i did seared steak and mashed potatoes and it was wonderful and it's all part of the uh the variety that oh, yeah. blue apron um gives you choose from a variety of new recipes each week or you could let blue aprons culinary team surprise you recipes are not repeated within a year so you'll never get bored i'm never bored I just like how it's flexible, too. You can customize your recipes each week based on your own preferences. Like, I don't like mushrooms. I'm not, I'm not going to include the mushrooms. Sorry, Blue Apron. If you send me mushrooms, I'm going to throw them out or I'm going to give them to my neighbor. 
or someone else. But keep sending the garlic because I have never <laughs> had a want for garlic since we've started this with Blue Apron, and it's easy. Garlic is in everything. I didn't realize that. Garlic and salt and pepper and olive oil in absolutely everything. So check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash missing. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash missing. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Let's quickly mention our new uh, our live show that's coming up on uh, Sunday, November 19th at 6 p.m. in Somerville, Massachusetts. Take it away, Lance. Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, right in the heart of uh, Davis Square. It's the Rockwell Theater. It's where we did our last live show for Crawl Space, where we had uh, Lucy and Greaves on, and, and we had uh, the Cryptic Antiquarian on, um, and uh, it was a great turnout. Get your tickets now for this one because we're pretty much ready to sell out. Um, the, the, the capacity is right around 190, and we set aside tickets for um, you know certain individuals. So we're, we're, we're rapidly approaching the, uh, the sellout point. Um, Art and Maggie from the show will be there. Mart. Mart, as we call them now, uh, just to save our, our, our vocal cords. And um, they will be there. These questions that we're, uh, that we're addressing here, you can ask them person to person. Oh, that'll be great. We'll do a QA and a at the, at the end of you know, our conversation with, Matt, with Mart on uh, the 19th. I'll come with all my questions. Don't Perfect. you worry. Yeah. Perfect. So we are selling tickets uh, through Brown Paper Ticket. The link to that will be in the show notes. It's on all of our social networking uh, sites. So, uh, again, we are very close to selling out. And um, if you're considering going, I'd click on that link and uh, and, and reserve your spot. Um. Well, one other thing I want to talk about is the DNA, uh, Chloe. <laughs> right before we started rolling, uh, you you called the you called your shot on this one, right? When the Natalie Holloway DNA uh, situation was going on, um, you came by my place. We had a quick conversation, and you were like, "Oh, DNA is going to happen in this in this uh, case too with the Maura Murray uh, show." And I'm like, uh, "I don't think so," <laughs> and you nailed it. <laughs> I didn't know at the time, but uh, this DNA evidence. What do you think of this? I, it was amazing to hear that they were able to get not one but two people from that DNA profile from the blood sample. I wish that they were able to figure out who. You know, they said that the definite profile they had was a male and that they had a partial profile that they couldn't completely isolate from it and they couldn't identify if it was male or female. And I believe Chuck West said that the chain of custody was too unclear and that they didn't have enough to be able to confirm that it was anyone, but... The fact that they were able to gather something from that was truly amazing to me, right. and I, I think it's amazing because you you guys were the ones that cut those those wood chips off, right? We we took pieces from the upstairs floor, and John Smith was the one that took um, the much larger uh, samples from the downstairs closet underneath the um, a frame stairs that go to you know up. Th that's the closet that the cadaver dogs hit on back in the 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 family. PI run search back in 2006, I think it was. Uh, so they hit on that closet, which means that the dogs thought that there was a dead body at, in that closet at one point. Right. These aren't these aren't like um, scent dogs that will pick up a dead uh, raccoon. Right. And I saw there was some discussion like, oh, what if it was menstrual blood? Oh my god! In the closet that like, annoyed me to no end. A cadaver dog took a hit on it. Someone was probably dead in there. Not to mention the profile that they were able to get was a man, so I don't think that it was menstrual blood. And they did get a female profile too. Uh, and there's oh, they the, did. Yeah, so what, there was one man and one female is what is what oh. we know. And but we didn't know that they had a whole profile yet, and we still don't know if they could get one. But we we believe that they could potentially get one. Did I miss that on the show? I thought they said they weren't able to confirm whether or not it was male or female I for the second one. I can't remember if that happened on the show or if that was something we talked to Maggie and Art about afterwards. Later. I thought it was on the show that it was a woman. 
Oh, uh, yeah. And they said it could be Mora. Yeah. yeah, I remember she said that, that, like, are you going to take this to the police because it could be Mora? And when they were discussing it at that point, it sounded like, you know, with the DNA profile, you have the numbers to compare it to with the origin profile. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, here we go. They can just look at Mora's sample that they definitely have and compare the numbers. But then they said they couldn't. So that that kind of confused me a little bit. I don't know if you have any insight on that. I don't really. Um, but I think it is still being worked on. That That is what I what we know. So there is some more information potentially to come out about this DNA. Right. What we don't know is what we don't know. And that is there. They control it now. And when I say they, it's the people testing the DNA. And we should we should have faith that these people are going to do their due diligence and and do a proper job with testing it. It's very small. And Art reiterated this several times. It's a very small sample. Mm -hmm. It's a very small sample. There's much larger samples that are that exist or hopefully exist in the house in the place, in the closet that the cadaver dogs hit on. And still, yeah. still as hopefully, unless something, some massive renovation happened, which would involve digging up the cement foundation. But um, just have faith that DNA is in the hands of the right people. Yeah. And I know that we're not privy to this, but I wonder if, if that bloody knife that Fred ended up submitting to the police that was given to him by... Who was it? The brother, Larry, Larry Moulton. Larry Moulton. I, I wonder if it's the same blood. If they're able to compare the blood on that knife versus the blood on those on the wood. I'd say if that was the case right now, if they you you would have seen some. Um, there, there probably would have been something uh, along the lines of a, a search warrant or an arrest at this point. Well, yeah, I have a theory about it, actually. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I think that that Larry brought this knife to Fred knowing that it wasn't the murder weapon, but he wanted to get his brother investigated uh, because he knew that he either did do something or potentially could have done something. But Larry, you know, we heard a lot about Larry too, being kind of a, uh, a weird guy too. Right. And why give it to Fred? Why not give it to the police? It's just, it's a little indirect. And you'd think that if it was, if like you said, you don't think it was more as blood, but if it was, you'd think there would be an arrest or there would have been an arrest there should be something that's moving forward at this right. point. So it probably wasn't. Just it would have been. Yeah. I, the Moulton brothers. I, you know, they they're filed in the in the under the section. Super shady individuals that you can't put a you know put your finger on. We can't describe them. You know, you're like I heard he's a, a weird character. Um, that was being nice. And that right. Uh, we've heard that th these guys are monsters. We've we've also heard that they're very loving men. <laughs> right. People have come forward on the Facebook discussion groups with screenshots of people testifying to Claude's character, saying that he's the, he was this loving man. But yeah. I think even the worst people can show different sides of themselves. Like my favorite example is Ted Bundy saved, I don't know if it was hundreds or thousands of lives working for a suicide hotline. So there was a good side to him that helped people, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he had an evil side. So I don't think, I think people can think awfully black and white about what people are capable of just because they do one good thing or one bad thing. Or because you're this person's niece or nephew or something like right. that. Right. Yeah, of course you're going to have a different perspective. Right. And Ted Bundy probably got off by saving lives as much as he got off, you know, the power that he the had. Control. And I'm not comparing Claude Moulton or Larry Moulton to Ted Bundy by oh, any means. Oh, me neither. Sorry. Uh, no, oh, no. I, <laughs> Sorry. It was a great, it's a great story. Um, <laughs> well, well, he, he what, did have, he does have, you know, I think I think this is confirmed that he has uh, seven different kids from six women. So so seven kids from six different women. That's Claude, the guy who lived in the A-frame house the time Mora went missing. So the, that it, you're you're talking about a guy who has to be somewhat charismatic. I have no idea what he looks like. He might be, you know, he might be really handsome guy. Uh, I I don't know, but you know he's. That's uh, he's got some game, I guess. I mean, yeah, he must maybe. be somewhat charming. I mean, we hear psychopaths are charming, like Ted Bundy, for example, didn't have a problem getting a date. No, I mean, he has a daughter out there too. But I'm not going to speak to the sexual prowess of. Oh no, I mean, Claude I'm not Moulton. even trying yeah, to even. either. I'm just, I'm just saying that he could, he must have had some char charisma. But even if he, he must have had some he, sort of attraction. Yeah, you'd think, but even if he didn't, I just, I think most people can find someone out there who can say something good about you, even if you've done horrible things. There's going to be, you'd think, at least one person that can speak to something nice you did. Once. Not Lance. I've gone a long Not time without, yeah. without some confirmation. I'll, I'll speak for you. I got you. Thank I'll you. vouch for you. 
my thing about the DNA is that, like, how many other missing people were rumored to have been killed in that house? And and Mora went missing a, a mile away. So I, I just think that's wild that that she went missing a mile away. DNA was found in this house. To my knowledge, there's no other people that are supposed to be missing in that area. I really feel like there's a good chance that if they can get a profile, it is Mora. Right. Well, and it sounds like just from the... I can't remember the man's name, but the person that was in charge of the fishing game searches. Todd. 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 I think he said that out of the many, many people that he's looked for, only two people haven't been found, and one of them is Mora. So there's only so many people who have gone missing in that area. Tells me she didn't didn't go walking off. Um, And we just talked about Claude potentially having some charisma, and everyone says, well, what what car is Mora going to get into? What stranger's car would Mora get into if she didn't say yes to Butch Atwood? It would be someone that wasn't going to call the police presumably because that's i think a big fallacy if she said no to butch why would she say yes to anyone else butch lived right down the road said he was going to call the police said he lived right down the road and he was he was a bus driver and i know they go through background checks i would have been i wouldn't have gone into that bus with him or i wouldn't have gone to his house i just think she changed her mind right there's a yeah i i I think he approached her before she had abandoned her car he he came up on her car before she was done trying to start it again and it could have been before she made calls like she could have said to him like i'm gonna call triple a and he misheard her or the circumstances definitely could have changed and most likely did change after he left and she was alone and it was cold and she needed a ride probably I think that the most likely scenario is that she would have accepted a ride from someone that didn't live right down the road or didn't advertise that they lived right down the road, weren't going to call the police, and maybe looked less threatening. Sure. And I, I think at this point we can safely say that there's a before... There's a before the... Uh, before... Um, there's a, like a before Butch Atwood mindset and an after Butch Atwood mindset. Or I, I think and it's more, the car. I, I would say the, b- before she tried to start her car, and then after she sure. realized the car doesn't start. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So there's a before and after. There's yeah. a, I can get the car out of here. I'm going to try to get the car out of here. that's when Butch came. I'm going to say no to this help, because I just get hit in the face with a airbag, and I'm hung up, so probably not thinking clearly. And then there's a, I'm not getting the car out of here. I need to come up with an alternative. Right. Oh, and, and right in there is when she... What I think is when she went to the trunk and, and put the rag in the tailpipe, right. went back into her car, tried to start it again, and then it didn't it didn't work. We know from the black box that there was no accident before that one. And we also know that she tr- tried to start a car seven times after that accident right there in the corner. So she was trying to get the car the hell out of there. Right. And she, she must have put the rag in there herself. I don't think that's any mystery at this point. And then after she realized that didn't work, that's when she decided to take a little stroll down the road, and then I think she got into a car. Everything, every detail that that is documented says that. I think you, so, You yeah. do fill in a little bit on your own, um, or you, uh, you know, everybody. You fill in a little bit on your own, but it really is just something that makes sense. Right. What the Westman saw, what the Marat saw, what Butch says he saw, and what he heard, and what was left. A car hung up in the snowbank, a car hung up on the side of the road with a rag in the tailpipe. Faith says she saw the activity by the trunk. We know that Fred told Mora if your car was sputtering to put the rag in the tailpipe to get by. We know the Marat said that they saw the uh, reverse lights coming on, and we know that the black box says she tried to start the car several times. So that yeah. seems to me like somebody who thought that they were going to get some power out of their car by putting a rag in the tailpipe and getting out. And then she stopped trying and said, well, Maybe I'm going to go up and accept this guy's offer to get warm in his house, use his phone. And if I use his phone, that will keep him off the phone from calling the police if I can call AAA. Right. Maybe she wasn't thinking that detailed, but it, she, w- she walked up in that direction. We know she did. When we talk about things being debunked, the fact that we know that she didn't get into an accident before that based on the black box results debunks. The, that was a big part of the conspiracy theory that she slid right. off the road not long before the 727 call in a different circumstance. So that's debunked because that, I think, that fed into the police conspiracy theory because in that scenario, the police were already aware of her and were looking for her, which people connected to the fact that they that the SUV passed Witness A twice. Maybe they were kind of looking around for her, but if she didn't get into an accident before that, that kind of debunks that. And also that 
she's tried starting the car seven times that I see a picture of someone desperately trying to start the car and doing whatever they could to get away from there. She didn't want to leave the car there. And I think the rag in the tailpipe was not gr- not good advice. I think Fred would say that now too. But in that position, I think she was willing to try anything to get out of there. Yeah. You even dig deeper into the rag in the tailpipe thing and the car not running well. And the reason why Fred was with Moore that weekend was to look for a new car. I mean, all of these things have been staring us in the face for years. And too many people have said, no, these are lies. He, I mean, you look at it. He, he gave her bad advice to get by until they went to go buy a car, yep. which he went up there to do. Yep. Yeah. So, like I said, we're talking about debunking things. I right. think that red herring is yeah. off the table. I think the $4,000 and Fred stopping at eight different ATMs potentially um, – to get the four thousand dollars cash kind of makes people assume that he's lying about the rest of it It, because it seems really weird on the surface and we've talked about this a lot ad nauseum but uh you know i just think that's him i just think he's that's his personality right also something interesting we were talking about butch atwood and i don't want to take us too far back but one of the things that cecil smith offered was that he didn't know butch but john smith was actually able to unearth I don't know who took the notes, but maybe it was the McDonald's that were interviewing. Yeah, I believe it was uh, Bob Bob's sister. I thought it was or, yeah, sister or wife. I'm not sure, but okay. there was he actually like posted the typed up notes where Butch said that he and Cecil Smith were friends and that were they were old friends for a long time. And Cecil Smith offered in the most recent interview that he didn't know Butch, so that's right. a little odd. Well, Butch has also said that he was a former police officer, right. which he wasn't, so maybe he has a thing about being uh, in with the cops or whatever, or maybe he really does have you know some friends, and he's like a friend of a friend of Cecil's or something like that. Maybe Butch just has a compulsive lying attitude because his... Was she leaning against the car? Was she out of the car? Was she inside the car? Story. Was her hair up? Was her hair down? It's like all these little little details and, and the inconsistencies with the lie detector tests. Maybe he just has like a slight problem with not being able to tell the truth. Maybe he feels this compulsion that he has to elaborate or lie about something. And that people, some people are <laughs> like that and people have openly accused him of that. I, I believe John Healy straight up said that he was a pathological liar and we've like you said, he said he was a police officer and he wasn't. That's a we, that's a lie that he has been caught in and he's been inconsistent with his accounts about his conversation with Mora. So if it's just his personality and he's just a pathological liar, I suppose it's not productive to go too deep in how those lies function because they probably just function to entertain him because he's bored. But when you're talking about one person saying they're not friends, they never met, and the other one saying that they are, one of them is not telling the truth. Yeah, it's probably Butch. It's probably Butch, <laughs> right? Probably. I don't. I don't know for a fact. I don't know for a fact yeah. either. But it's it's probably Butch. Because but if we it's know not, he lied before, right? But if it's not, we have to talk about. We have to think about why. And if they didn't know each other, it's an interesting but not an unprecedented choice to enlist his help into searching. What else, Chloe? What What else from the TV show were were big moments or or Lance? Uh, what, what was another big moment that you think we we should talk about here? Like a takeaway. The last episode, I think, received the most criticism from from listeners just because it was they gave a lot of time to the psychic, and and that didn't really take them anywhere. It didn't really it wasn't right. really productive. And I think people were foreseeing a storyline following a suspect because I think that was kind of teased, but that didn't end up happening either. And I'm sure it was for legal reasons. But that I don't know. I, th- I think when people are really being critical of the show, that's the episode that I noticed the most. Yeah, that people. Well we, well, we can follow up on the persons of interest because it is a legal thing with oxygen, you know, so, but it's not really with us. Um, and as far as the medium Allison Dubois goes, uh, this was not Maggie or Art's or Mart's decision to bring her in. Um, she has worked with Bravo on the Real Housewives uh, program and Bravo and Oxygen are kind of like sister companies. So it seemed like a like they they that was their decision, the network's decision. So. I think that's a, a big misunderstanding with with people criticizing the show is assuming that Maggie and Art called all the shots and that all of the choices were theirs. And it, like you were just saying, it wasn't. They had a whole network that they had to work with. Yeah. And lawyers. And lawyers. Tons of lawyers. Right. If, and it, if only they had 
all the freedom they could, I think it would have been different, but... Right. And we do know that there was a lot that went on behind the scenes as far as, you know, the the interviews that took place. You know, you got, only got to see like 30 seconds here and 15 seconds there. And a TV show has to do some sort of teasing for when they're, you know, they need to get people to watch. And I've said this to the point where it's probably getting annoying now. But the yes, the, it is. The, I don't uh, even know what you're going to say, but it's already annoying. I'm annoyed. The uh, the sum of the parts of the show aren't as important as the whole of the show. And the whole of the show is really what is it's getting more people to talk about it and these conversations are happening a lot faster now and they're going away a lot faster Mm -hmm. like what about this what about red herring x and then that's gone because it just feels like the conversation isn't like dwelling in its own um like pool of of uh, like gesticulation you know there's it's evolved it's evolved to this the conversations have evolved we're we're not dealing with the same issues we were talking about online uh, two months ago i mean and just for we, we can list many examples right now, but I think notably talking to Erin, her classmate, about um, the pregnancy, the assignment about uh, maternal medicine. And right. I think the word is um, teratogens or tetragens, things that can impact a fetus when you're pregnant. The fact that we that was something that was discussed, that maybe there was an assignment. And we knew that she was in a maternal nursing class, but having that confirmed by a classmate who received her portion of the assignment on February 9th. That was pretty amazing. And just there were a lot of things like that where these red herrings were just and people don't like the word, but debunked. Right. And that kind of takes away the idea or at least like what some people would point to as evidence uh, or circumstantial evidence that Mora was pregnant. Right. So now there's not even circumstantial evidence you can point to her being pregnant. So that was the only one. It's okay. It's your opinion um, that you think Mora was pregnant. But. Yeah, yeah, it's not based on anything now. Right. So that 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 conversation's evolved. Yeah, that's right. it's, it's evolved, and that's how fast it goes. Right. It, you know, you say it, and then you say, "Well, this person, it's 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 backed up." Right. You know, there's there's uh, corroboration there. It's it's totally backed up, and people don't like the psychic. I personally didn't like the psychic angle, but that doesn't matter because that doesn't it it doesn't it didn't impact the 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 case in a negative way. No. It, the the show. They, you know, they need to put a psychic on because the psychics, people, some people like psychics. So people watched and those people might have got something else out of the show. So that's what the impact or, is. Or given people different avenues to think. I right. don't know. I just think the show was really important because it closed a lot of rabbit holes that we were unwittingly wasting our time on. We were jumping into them because it was our due diligence because we needed to figure it out. And they helped us. They helped all of the community with with closing these holes, I think. Yeah, so. I think so. Like when you saw those dogs, when you saw that dog sit down right right at the corner of Bradley Hill and Route 112, I, there's no question in my mind after that. Like right. she got in a car. We hear, you know, we've heard that the dog stopped 100 yards up the road. I remember when you asked those questions to law enforcement, they couldn't really confirm it. They wouldn't really directly answer the question. And there's been criticism in the past that it was too long and all of these things. But I really think that the show showed us how the scent trail works and the science behind it and just giving us that actual demonstration for me. And we also learned that the dog did it not once, but twice. I I hadn't heard that before the show. Right. Two different dogs, I believe. Two different dogs. So that's, that's a measure of reliability there that they did it twice. Yeah. In need of great talent for your business but short on time, you don't have to get lost in a huge stack of resumes to find your perfect hire. You just need the right tools, smarter tools. Oh, there's your stack. Oh, that's that's me digging out of my stack of resumes. What were you saying? <laughs> I'm saying that with ZipRecruiter, you don't have to do that anymore. Now you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. So you can rest easy knowing that your job is being seen by the right candidates. Then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting. So you receive the best possible matches. It's brilliant. And that's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. So, yeah, no matter... 
So no wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Find out why ZipRecruiter has been used by growing businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for guess how much? A million dollars. Close. For free. What? Yep, that's right. Free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. And one more time to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. <laughs> ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay, so last topic here today of this episode that we want to touch upon is uh, a new theory that's been put out there by uh, James Renner, and it, it involves some allegations uh, against Bill Roush. Uh, if you haven't heard this stuff yet, you can check out James's blog. It's interesting. I don't know where we're going with it. I don't know what the heck's going on with it, but it seems like uh, when something happens in the world, the Mora Murray case sort of uh, mirrors it. So there's all these... People coming out about uh, these sexual accusations about Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and all these things in the real world going on. And then what's going on in the Maura Murray case is these allegations against Bill. And there's people coming out talking about Bill not being a good guy and saying some weird stuff. What do you think of this stuff? The stories are disturbing. And I find the people that were telling them to be credible, if you guys listen to the recorded accounts, it sounds like bill had a pattern of being predatory and just not respectful to the point of assaulting women allegedly allegedly we we hear stories i believe we have heard things in the past implying that he could have been physical with mora allegedly and i think that came from um hossein baghdadi through james renner that james got the impression from Haas that bill could get physical with mora we're hearing a lot of different stories. I just, I think it proves that, I don't think it proves anything yet. I think it implies that Bill is not a very good guy. I don't think it gives us any proof about his involvement with Mora. We know that he wasn't there. Yeah. I think she had a boyfriend that wasn't very good, but he wasn't there. Right. He wasn't in New Hampshire when Mora went missing. When Mora went missing, he wasn't there. And he was there in the following days. And I think... Some people have been theorizing that maybe he found her. You know, it is documented that he was in New Hampshire after she went missing. And if she was still alive then, that maybe he could have found her and was so enraged that he killed her. But when you think about all of the all of the things that he had to do to get away with that, I just don't think it makes a lot of sense. Let's It's really it's it's really hard to comment on Bill in the Moore Murray case and Bill in his life that's this alleged sexual predator that we're hearing through James Renner and his blog. Bill is doing what he should be doing by keeping quiet. He, he probably has lawyers saying, the second you open your mouth, you're opening up a whole can of worms and you don't say a word. You don't comment on this. And that, that's, that's just what is being done by probably his smart lawyers um as as far as taking that and if if these allegations are true i mean he's a sexual monster if these allegations are true and and it would appear that he's escalating by pushing people downstairs um why would you say sexual monster because these are sexual. There was only abuse. one story that involved. Or, or were, okay, I guess the the, yeah. the first story involved a, sort of an attempted sexual in the uh, office. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah I mean, it all seems very sexually okay. based. Yeah, anyway. the story. With the she was, choking. Yeah. She was pushed over a table, and he kept pushing her back down. In, in this story, that's that's right, what that's was what being she said. said. It's pretty yeah. sexual. Yeah, that okay. yeah, and yeah. then, and then pushing like 
allegedly pushing someone, the same person down the stairs in a subway. That story's terrifying. Just I lived in the DC. The story's terrifying. And yeah. those 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 uh, yeah. escalators are so long. Like he could have killed her if that's yep. true. If that's true, and and that's a, that's a separate investigation, right? And and to put that in with with more. Okay, so maybe he did this. We don't know. What happened 13 and a half years ago with Mora, you all, you have to look at it as, as a separate thing. You have to look at it as, as column A and column B. Yeah. Until something is proven. Right. In col- like if, if column A is Mora and column B is this, this the, these allegations, you can't put them together until you have a connection. Right. Until you have a proof of, either, of, of column B. You can't put them together. And with the with the phone records, if he tracked her down, he would have to be making attempts to call her. I know there's a question about this three minute call that that was on the phone records, and it's presented as um, a long voicemail. Right before that call is a one minute call, and let's say that this is a boyfriend who is in his early twenties and his girlfriend's missing, and what was it six days later four days later six days later i think it was on the 15th he made this call call last like lo, like last ditch effort calls her calls her phone the call right before that is one minute the call right after that is three minutes so he calls gets voicemail hangs up when you're calling somebody on the phone record whenever it get, whenever it picks up the phone record will will register a minute that's how they charge those phones you you paid you know you had so many minutes on your plan so it registers a minute so no matter what it's a minute even if you hung up on the person even, when right. they answered it would register as a minute even if voicemail picks up it 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 registers as a minute so you have to you have to imagine you call somebody voicemail picks up voicemail's what 10 15 20 seconds of leave a message at the beep and then he leaves his message it could have been his message could have been 45 seconds which seems reasonable if you're the boyfriend looking for your girlfriend i would leave i feel like i would leave many voicemails yeah right. i feel like it would be a lot longer than that actually so it, 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 it could have been I'm, I'm i'm giving the benefit of the doubt here and saying even at even if it went to two minutes and 15 seconds including the intro leave your message at the beep it still registers as three minutes right so it's not somebody who leaves this long ass voicemail for ten minutes. It it actually just sounds like someone left a voicemail. We're hearing we're hearing a lot of disturbing stories, and I think right now it's just a distraction. Like one of the anecdotes we heard was that Bill would go on TV and played the part of the sad boyfriend to pick up women. That's horrible. When when I read that, I was disgusted. I don't even we don't even know if it's true, but if it is, it's disgusting. But it's still not proof that he did anything it's still not connecting him to anything i just think it's distraction yeah so we do have to take these incidents separately uh and kind of keep them separate as long as we can uh and see where it goes but it is interesting i mean if nothing else the allegations are very interesting yeah Uh, the most frustrating thing about it is if you put everything of the allegations into column b and you're looking for proof in column b you're probably never going to find proof Right. Bill is not coming out and admitting anything. Bill's not coming out and denying anything because his lawyers are saying the second you open your mouth, it's over. You look guilty. Well, they need, you know, Mora's Mora's body, if that's the case. If Bill killed her, Mora's body will tell the story. Right, because that, good, that's column A. Yeah. Then you've proven something in column A, and if it's it's proof towards Bill, then, then column B is more believable. And, like, in column A, we have, you know, when someone is... When, when someone meets foul play, it's usually by someone they know. We have a potentially established history of being controlling, being violent. We have both parties potentially cheating on each other. There's a lot of, there, there are circumstantial things in column A, but what we have missing and what is glaring is that he wasn't there during the time of the crash. He was in a different state miles away, that wait, thousands of miles away. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys for uh, for chatting today, and thank you very much out there for listening to this episode we will be back with more soon follow us on twitter at moramari doc and check out crawlspace too check us out on twitter at crawlspace pod thank you very much Bye.